I guess we can begin. Um, my name is Steve Weber. I want to talk to you about Multics. Um, as you can see from the slide, uh, it now has an end date that's been officially canceled by Honeywell in the sense that they don't plan to support it forever, which is kind of the implicit assumption for most operating systems. Uh, they plan to support it for a couple more years. Um, it really began in 1965, and I'll go through the history in a sec. Uh, one of the things I want to mention about what MULTIC stands for is, is that acronym right there, Multiplex Information and Computing Service. The, uh, the key word there is service. It's probably the first computer system that really tried to be a service, 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week um, facility. And towards the end, and certainly now, it's, it's at that level. Initially, it was, it was kind of a joke. Um, <coughs> Greg was telling me some of the other acronyms that were used for Multics. One was many unusually large interfering completely with service, large tables interfering completely with service. Uh, one of its features is that from the very beginning, it was a very large operating system. Uh, and there were a lot of data structures. And towards the end, we had to split apart uh, many of the tables within the system because of the segmentation, which we'll get to, uh, restricted the size of certain tables. So. Multics is, uh, is one of the, uh, uh, the third point there is a famous quote that I wanted to bring out. It's, it's the greatest confluence of new ideas in the history of computer science. Uh, it's now famous. That's the first time you've probably heard that. Um, this is the overview of the talk. I want to go into some of the history, uh, maybe mention some anecdotes along the way. As, as you probably know, there are probably 20 other multicians in this room. Uh, a multician is someone that's worked on Multics. There are two breeds of them, basically. There are Sicilians who worked at CISL, which is the Cambridge Information Systems Lab in uh, Cambridge, uh, kind of on the MIT campus. Uh, there are Phoenicians, who is the other branch of Multics that lives in Phoenix, uh, where a lot of the later development and support went on. Um, and so, so some of this terminology, will, will you'll hear it during the talk. Um, uh, there's a lot of history I want to just go over briefly. Some of it will, uh, although the, the introduction said that they were going to talk a lot about Unix, uh, that'll be on a demand basis. It, uh, it, is, it is definitely a spin-off of Multics. Um, hardware, I want to go into that, into the architecture, why General Electric got into the game at all. Uh, and in particular, the CPU architecture, because that's the only thing that distinguishes Multics hardware from uh, any other hardware. The, the memories, the I.O. controllers, and everything else are pretty much standard Honeywell products. And I want to go into the software. And there are a lot of points in the software. I don't plan on going into a lot of detail. Uh, I want to keep the talk to less than an hour or, or so. Um, in 61, MIT uh, built a time sharing system called CTSS, which was a very nice time sharing system. It was built on a 7094 IBM computer. It actually had a couple of banks of 32K words of memory. Um, and it was a very good uh, time sharing system that lasted for years, even after uh, everyone wanted to, everyone was through with it. It was running for years with two or three users on it because they couldn't migrate their applications. Um, uh, after about three or four years of experience with that system and three or four file systems with that particular operating system, they, they undertook at MIT, this is primarily MIT at this point, to do basically a version two of CTSS. Uh, the, version, the second version, they wanted to come up with a better acronym, and they came up with Multics. But they basically, being in the, kind of on the dawn of computer science at that point in time, tried to throw in every bright idea that anyone in the academic community had ever thought of. And, th and they did, and, they, and a lot of them worked, and, and they actually pulled it off. Um, the design began in 65, and in the full joint computer conference papers, they published about half a dozen papers about some of the ideas and the way they were going to do it. By spring of 66, those papers were all obsolete, of course, because no one had tried to do any of this. But the, the seeds were all there way back in 65. Most of the ideas were, were really there. Probably the critical idea that wasn't in those papers was the, the concept of virtual files. That hadn't quite crystallized yet. Uh, at any rate, a triumvirate of uh, three corporations, MIT, GE, and Bell Labs, got together to do this 
which was at the time a research project. Uh, I'll get into why they wanted to do it. Uh, during 66 through 69, there was the initial implementation, and by the end of 69, it was a, a good working computer system that a lot of applications were up and running on MIT. It was still internal. There were a few sites, uh, but it wasn't a commercial product. That didn't happen until later on. Uh, it was initially implemented on a GE computer. What they did was they built a 645 computer. It was a version of the 635 that all had the necessary hardware extensions that I'll get into in a, in a bit. In 69, Bell Labs pulled out, and this was a, a crushing blow to the multitions within the Bell Labs organization. Uh, some of them were Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, Joe Osana. Uh, there were several others. Uh, they were all crushed and went off and did their own thing. A year or two later, there was this little mini computer operating system called Unix uh, that Thompson and Ritchie pulled together. It had a lot of Multix ideas in it, uh, path names and uh, generalized I.O. devices and whatnot, the shell, uh, that came out of the Multix experience, had some of the same flaws that Multix has. Processes were expensive, didn't scare them. They used them for everything. Uh, and to this day, that hurts Unix applications if they have to do a lot of forking. Um, so Unix uh, was kind of spun off in the years that followed that split by Bell Labs. In about 1971, and I'm, I'm not sure of these last two dates on this slide, uh, GE got out of the computer business and sold everything they had to Honeywell. Honeywell, um, in, in the sale, inherited two major operating systems. They were later to get even more to, to, to create a real problem for them internally. The two operating systems they got were GCOS, GCOS 3, which at the time was a very good operating system for spinning tapes, tape mergers and sorts. It's, for all I know, it's still good at that. Um, and Multics, which no one at the time knew what they were getting with Multics. Multics at the time was a fairly small project, and no one was really too worried about it. So it was kind of put on the back burner for a while, although the funding continued. And people continued to get paid. Um, in 1972, they had actually taken Multic so seriously that they built another generation of the hardware. At this time, the, the GE 635 product line was migrating, and it had become the, the 6000 line. And one of the computers in that line was a processor. Again, just a processor is the only difference here for the Multic system. And this processor had uh, a bunch of neat features. It has associative memories. It had a single page size. The initial Multics computer, the 645, had two page sizes, 64 words and 4096 bytes, or 1024 words. Um, when they went to 72, they, we, we went simplifying assumptions. We, we specified exactly what we needed. We added rings into the hardware. Um, there were new instructions to support the ring support. We, we had an instru extended instruction set, which is still amazing to me that they ever got this to work, even to the degree that they did. It's a very complicated instruction set, and they can take, they can take page faults in many places that would really be embarrassing to most people. Um, they had a new clock, and they had a new uh, I.O. processor called an I.O.M. Now, the I.O.M. is a generalized I.O. multiplexer. Uh, it replaced what they called the GEOC, a generalized I.O. controller. Um, it was just a newer implementation of some of the basic ideas. The GEOC was really uh, designed primarily to handle a lot of um, communication lines, and they put a lot of effort into that. When they did the IOM, they didn't have as much support in there, and so as you'll see in the architecture in a little while, they, need a, they really need a front-end processor in addition to the IOM to, to support communications. Um, in 73, Honeywell actually offered Multics to anyone that wanted it for a nominal fee of a couple million dollars a shot. Um, 75, uh, cache CPU was added, was, a cache was added to the CPU. It's a small cache, but it, it was right in the middle of a major performance improvement where MIT said, look, you got to double the performance in a year or we're backing out of the whole deal. So several things went on at that time. One was the re-implementation of the communication software. Another was the addition of the cache. Another was some improvements in the uh, way down in the guts of the operating system. And although no benchmark said there was a doubling, we could convince them because we couldn't benchmark everything that we improved. And they said, OK. It was a bluff on their part anyway. Um, <laughs> the next major milestone was probably in 1980 when uh, the Stratus people started to leave. Uh, 
directly from CISL, there are probably 10 or 12 that now work at Stratus. And we've gotten many others from the field as well. Uh, and as you probably all know, last month, this month, I guess, Honeywell announced that they were going to cap it. So that's kind of the end of that. Um, IBM was not chosen. Uh, I mean, CTSS was done on IBM computers. And so it was somewhat of a blow to IBM way back then. They weren't the giant they are now, that they weren't chosen for this uh, really neat research job, this, this really state-of-the-art time-sharing system that was being developed by MIT. And the reason was they didn't have the architecture that was needed. They didn't have the ability to, to crossbar memories and CPUs and I.O. controllers and whatnot. They, they only had uh, fixed, very restricted uh, configurations that they could throw together. That's why GE was selected. Um, GE just had a, they were already um, enough ahead to, to win that battle. At the interim, though, while this Multics project was going on, IBM was developing two major systems, TSS, which never did really succeed, and CPCMS, as it was called back then, uh, which was uh, both of these were paging virtual memory um, operating systems. CPCMS uh, was a virtual machine interface that let you each user get its own little machine, a different approach to time sharing than was taken by Multics. Right, it's now known as VM. <clears throat> that was also developed in the same building that a lot of Multics was developed in. Um, some of the Multics goals, first one is to provide a service quality interactive computer system. It was classical time sharing. It was done for time sharing. It, wasn't, it was done for uh, basically, people didn't understand the difference between various interactive uh, reasons for having computer systems. It's not transaction processing. Uh, you know, it's, it wasn't batch. It was just interactive use, and, and the word time sharing was used pretty uh, broadly at that time. But it was meant to be a service. It was meant to be there all the time. Uh, eventually, we got to unattended operation. That was a, a longer-term goal. We didn't get there until you know mid-70s. I mean, it's something that we take for granted with Stratus. Day one, we had to have that. Um, it's something that doesn't come easy if you don't think about it ahead. In particular, the specifics why these companies wanted to get into it, GE wanted to sell computers. Uh, they wanted to make some money. Um, they had this very large architecture for big machines. Bell Labs wanted a tool for research. And they also had a real problem of starting to get computers all over the country. And they, had, they, they thought this may solve that problem and somehow tie them all together. Uh, that didn't really happen. And MIT was just in it for the fun of it. Uh, it was a, a good research project. Uh, it was a good way to get uh, Defense Department money to fund their efforts. Most of the early Multics funding came from a Navy grant. Uh, that's how I got out of going to Vietnam, is it was on a uh, Defense Department um, sponsored project. Uh, some of the strengths of these uh, corporations, GE had experience in large systems. As I said, they had the, the right architecture. They, M IBM did not have the right architecture. And GE really had some good hardware designers then, enthusiastic, dedicated, and, and they still have them, I'm sure. Uh, Honeywell does. Most of these people went over to Honeywell. Um, but back then, they, I thought they were very impressive, some of the things they could pull off. Um, the extended instruction set is, is awesome. <laughs> um, Bell Labs, of course, um, they had a bunch of software designers. Uh, this is just when software was becoming more than a, a game, more than a, a hacker's tool. Yeah. Well, MIT didn't think they had it, and I wasn't in on the decision to go with GE to begin with. But, but well, the interconnectability. The 360. MIT had just announced that they would release CTSS to other universities, and the next day, IBM announced they were not going to take any further orders for 794. IBM, I, MIT was a little peeved about that. A right. little. The C CTSS, but I don't know when that announcement was, probably 63 or so. 64. 64. Um, CTSS by that time was already mature, and, and MIT was looking on to newer stuff, so yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, Bell Labs needed a solution to the enormous geographical problem they had. Uh, they had switches all over the place, and it was getting worse. They were trying to computerize much more and more of their 
uh, applications. They had good theorists, um, as did MIT. Uh, Bell Labs were good in electronics and switching and whatnot, and some of those ideas played very heavily into the design of the I.O. and of the system. Uh, they, were, they were authors of the I.O. parts of the fall joint papers of 65. And MIT had the experience of CTSS, which was very valuable. They had a, an infinite supply of students, most of them very bright, and so that there was a real talent pool there to work on. And a lot of the students really benefited from it, and certainly the Multix project did. And there were some pretty good professors, too, that, <laughs> that tried to get it. And probably one of the most important things that MIT did was they were the, they were the beta site for 15 years. They were the exposure site. And uh, th thank you, MIT. Right. Some of the historical problems. So, so that role has ceased, apparently. Um, some of the historical problems, uh, the size of the project was a problem. There was a good deal of turnover, particularly in the student community. Uh, we, we somewhat populated the other computer companies in the area with multi expertise. Um, multiple companies with conflicting interests was, was a problem. I mean, they all had the interest that they wanted to get a good, good computer system out there that everyone could work, but there were obviously problems. Uh, GE wanted it out now so they could start selling it and making some money. MIT wanted it to be elegant and grandiose and whatnot. Geographical separation was an issue, and that was an issue within Honeywell up till probably today. You know, half of the development is done in Cambridge, and half of it is done down in Phoenix. Plus, I, I still remember trying to do tape, tape, transfer tape contents from uh, MIT down to Bell Labs over a phone line, and that was real slow. Uh, <laughs> But these are the kind of things we had to do. The only way you could boot the system, uh, at least up to when I left, was over with a tape. And so if they wanted to boot a new version of the operating system, they'd mo move a tape down. There were missed schedules. They actually had bugs, and the system crashed once in a while. Um, probably no more than most operating systems, though. One of the real problems, though, was there was unnecessary generality and elegance. And uh, I have a quote in a sec from Corbido, who was probably the father of the whole Multics effort. He was the one that was the, that was the inspiring force. He was the one that always got the money from ARPA. He was the one that fought for it within the MIT community. And uh, the, the trade-off between uh, elegance and practicality is, is probably the key one in most large designs. Performance was a problem. The first page fault took 10 minutes, as I recall. I mean, we, we can do it now in about four milliseconds. And it's embarrassing on a system that's, that's touted to be virtual memory. You know, uh, so part of that problem was the fact that the very first implementation tried to take advantage of both page, page sizes, 64 words and 1024 words. And uh, very soon after that, it was realized that it's just not worth that, uh, particularly since you're going to wait for, at that time, 120 milliseconds for a disk read or a drum read. Uh, 64 words worth, it just wasn't worth it. Um, we, we improved that. We got that down into the couple of millisecond range. The first cold boot where we got to anything that looked like uh, a command level took over an hour. Um, that's you know with no directories out there to salvage or, or line adapters to load or anything like that. This is just trying to initialize itself. Um, don't tell them why your first boot crashed. I don't think I remember. Oh, so somebody tried to write a non-answer character. Oh, right. And edit didn't work. That's right. Um, oh, right. Uh, Paul was saying that the first boot crashed because someone tried to write a non-ASCII character to a terminal in, in the editor. Um, the, this is a pet peeve I have. One of the problems is that Honeywell didn't give it the support it needed and, and I think deserved. And for many years, Honeywell priced it arbitrarily high so that they wouldn't have to sell them and support them because they had no idea how to support this. No one of their vast sales force understood it, knew what it was. So they really weren't keen on selling it and supporting it. So uh, they, they sold just enough to budget it, to, to meet the, that year's budget. And as a matter of fact, I think for years and years it actually made money. But that was at two or three systems a year because they were so expensive. They got a couple of big customers hooked that, that really liked it and could afford it, like the government. And 
Ford and General Motors had a couple. Um, so some of the problem, some of the parts of history that weren't problems, though, is that there was a, there were extremely loyal customers. Once they got it, almost everyone loved it. Ford, as a matter of fact, turned it in once, but they couldn't live without it, so they got it again. Uh, the developers were very loyal to it. Most people that have worked on it really appreciate it for uh, for what it is, how what they've pulled off there. The system is very ex extensible, uh, as is Voss, and a lot of lot of what Multix is is carried over into Voss. Um, one of the, I'll mention some of the ways that extensibility came through, but it's, it's still a fairly young operating system, or it certainly was when I left uh, six years ago. Um, I mean, it was, it was done in such a way that it could be changed very effectively. Um, and there were very highly talented people that work on it, and they're scattered all over the computer industry now. Um, and I'm, I'm sure the industry has benefited from it. These are some quotes that have been associated with Multics that uh, are still true today. The first one is by Corby, uh, Professor Corpito. Um, the balance between generality and efficiency is a central engineering trade-off in the design of any large-scale system. And we know that in Voss. We have, to, uh, we have to make simplifying assumptions. We have to throw away some of the elegance in order to make it perform acceptably. Uh, the next one is attributed to many people if you don't understand the problem, make sure you implement cheap or simple solutions. Well, initially, we did not understand what we were doing with Multics, and we didn't implement cheap and simple solutions, and we paid for it. Uh, most of the reiterations, which uh, come in the third quote from Fred Brooks, is planning to throw one away, were simplifying assumptions. We simplified the grandiose algorithms that we started with. Um, nearly every part of Multics has been in, implemented at least twice. One of the few components that I think is still there, at least it was still there in almost its original form, was the IPC mechanism. And that lasted 15 years, and it still may in there, be in there 20 years. Well, here's a typical Baltics hardware configuration. Um, it doesn't use a bus architecture. It uses big <coughs> cables. And these cables have many wires in them, and they hook together all the many components of the system. The SCU is the uh, system control unit, and that's, that's the central point of the system. I mean, the central points of the system. Originally, there were eight ports on an SCU into which you could plug either uh, CPUs, uh, I.O. controllers, or clocks. A clock was a special active module all on its own. The Air Force. Uh, wanted more than eight ports because they had a very large configuration. So they took the eighth port and made it eight. So there were really 15 by the time <coughs> the, the hardware was done when I left. Um, the, uh, there was memory associated with the system control units. Uh, originally, we were trying to boot the system in 92K words, and that didn't work. Um, by the time we were really up to command level, this is in 1966. I mean, this is 20 years ago. We, we couldn't do anything without a megabyte. I mean, just recently, the rest of the computer industry needs a megabyte, but we needed it back then. And it kind of has spilled over into Voss. Uh, <laughs> Voss booted on one megabyte, though, first try. Wasn't all there. Um, from day one, Multics was a multiprocessor configuration, which is one of the unique features that they tried to throw in all at once. Uh, it had I.O. processors, and I, I use the term I.O.P. here because initially we had that thing called a GEOC, General I.O. Controller. Later on, we had an I.O.M. Uh, in the I.O.M. world, we needed a front-end processor to handle all the communications traffic. The uh, G.I.O.C. had that ability initially. Uh, that wasn't the right architecture. Besides, Honeywell wanted to sell their uh, mini computers as front-end processors. So we kind of had to go along with that. Um, OK. Right. OK, as I said earlier, the key uh, hardware difference between th that was needed for Multics was all concentrated in the processor. Uh, by the way, on that, that previous slide, th that architecture was the, ge the GE 6 600 line architecture. Multiple system control units, multiple processors, multiple I.O. controllers all hooking together. 
that's why that architecture was chosen over and the uh, over basically IBM's. Um, these are some of the features that were they're added to the processor. Paging. It's probably the first commercially available commercial commercial system that had paging in it. The first paging system I think was the Atlas system in '55. This is 10 years later. Someone else tried it. Um, Multics sure needed it because we had very large uh, virtual address spaces and we we needed uh, there's no way we could have got it all in memory at once. We were of course implementing on core memories. Had segmentation, something that's certainly not unique to Multics. Burroughs was very big on segmentation, but Multics was the first one to put these together in the way that they're together now. Um, I'll get into what segments are. Segments are key. Multiple processor capabilities, that's another important feature. One of the reasons that Multics was wanted, uh, one of the features that Multics wanted. It had rings. And the initial processor we had didn't have rings, so we had to simulate rings. And the way we did that is basically the way kernel trap works today. Uh, whenever you went from one level of privilege to another, you, you, you faulted, you, you validated your arguments, and then continued uh, in the higher level of protection. Similarly, on the way out, you had to uh, make sure that when you were returning arguments, you weren't going to store into memory and whatnot. Very much like what Voss does today. Uh, in the 72 version of the hardware, uh, the rings were implemented in hardware, and that's, that was a major undertaking. And we needed new instructions and all kinds of new things to pull that off. Uh, there were associative memories, and I'll show you where they come later on. That's needed for the, uh, for the page table words and segment descriptor words, which are the things that describe segments, as you might guess. Later on, we added the cache in the processor. As I mentioned, the extended instruction set. Uh, one of the features of the Multics CPUs is that it's addressable to the bit. Uh, that, that's, that's a place where they pro that's a, a place where they, they did that in order to support full PL1 because they really wanted full PL1 here. Uh, COBOL? COBOL? Maybe. Uh, anyway, um, that's probably extreme to go to the bit. Uh, <coughs> other successful architectures are are succeeding only addressing to the byte and when you need to go to the bit level doing something weird. Uh, that was all in the extended instruction set to worry about going to the bit. It was even worse for the uh, Multics, the 6,000 line processors, because it's a 36-bit word. You can't shift and take out powers of 2. It's, you have to divide by 9. And, and they also supported 6-bit bytes. And, matter of fact, down at the bottom here, they show, I, I point out what the problems were. It was a 36-bit word, and they supported either 4 or 6 bytes per word. Six bytes, of course, for compatibility from the VCD days. Um, the nine-bit bytes uh, that held a ASCII, of course, there were two extra bits, and so people started using those uh, as soon as they realized they had them there. 72-bit operands on 72-bit boundaries. So it was, it was like a 7094. This was the same type of organization 7094 had. I'll get into so some of those details in a, in a bit. Now, here's a very boring picture. This is what virtual memory looks like in Multics. This isn't to scale. Uh, <laughs> but um, what, what it's trying to point out is that all of virtual memory is just a series of segments. And each segment is potentially the same size, 256 pages, one megabyte. And uh, the number of segments that you can fit in, in a virtual address space uh, is limited by the hardware. The initial hardware limited it to 15, uh, 2 to the 15th segments. Uh, later, on the second round of hardware, although that particular, or you could still support 2 to the 15th segments, um, one of the particular formats of pointers only supported 2 to the 12th. So you, you were really crazy to use anything other than 2 to the 12th. Um, I'll, go, I'll go into a le later on how these segments are used, but basically what happens is, and this looks somewhat familiar, is that the kernel code and data is scattered through segments. Uh, in low-order memory, when I say low-order, small segment numbers. Um, matter of fact, segment zero was a descriptor segment that had all of the SDWs that described how the rest of the segments in the system worked. Um, there were stacks somewhere in the middle. There was a special register that said where the stacks worked, and the hardware figured out where the stack was depending on what ring you were executing in at the time. So the stacks were contiguous in regions of segments. And all of the user code and data and shared segments and files and everything w went above the stacks. The, 
what, what exists in a user process at any point in time is some subset of all of the files that exist in the global file system. So you can, you can look at the global file system, and it's a hierarchical file system, and, and that file, that file, that file, that file, some of them are mapped into your address space. At any given process, your own descriptor segment is mapped into your address space. KST, PDS, those are some other segments down in the, in the kernel that are mapped into your address space. But at any point in time, the segments up in user world are just mapped into files somewhere in the global file system. I'll, I'll go over this more. This is a critical feature of, uh, of Multics. A little bit more on segments. They're one megabyte. They're contiguous virtual addresses on 256-page boundaries. So a segment starts, if, if you treat the uh, virtual um, address as a segment number, page number, word offset, which is a, a good way to think of it, or one way to think of it, uh, then that first point applies. There's no concept of uh, overflowing from one segment into the next. That, there's no possibility to do that. If you, if you go out of bounds beyond the 256th page of one segment, uh, there's no way to address above that. You're, uh, um, the, the, the point being there is that the virtual address has got this segment number, and that segment number could have been any one of those 4,000 segments in your address space, and you don't know which segment number is right above it. Um, the, a segment is treated as a single entity. It has the same access for all pages. Initially, uh, there was access control in the page table word that said whether it was whether it was code data, uh, whether it could execute whether it was privileged or whatnot. Um, in the second release of the hardware, that was all removed from the page table words and it existed only in the segment descriptor words, so that the segments uh, have uniform access. Uh, a segment could be smaller than 256 pages. As a matter of fact, most of them were. Uh, there was a bound field in the descriptor for a segment that was down to 16 words, so you could have fairly small segments. What that meant, if you looked at your virtual address spaces, that you couldn't put any more data until you got to the next 256 page boundary. So that there could be small segments, but uh, you can't use up the space above a small segment until you get to the next one. There was read, execute, write access on segments, and there's something called ring brackets, and I'll get into that in a sec. That has to do with the way rings fit into the architecture. And one of the key points of segments was that they were shareable. And of course, that brings into the whole issue of encacheability and how that was handled in Multics, and uh, pretty similar to what we did in Voss. They were clever in that sense. Um, Multics' use of segments, I think, was one of its most unique and important features. And basically what it is, it, it's just virtual files. Everything in Multics in the address space was a virtual file. Yeah. Yeah. The real size of a, a word is 36 bits. And it was 1024 of those is one page. So it was 4096 by 9 bit words. So it's a little bit bigger than ours, 12.5% uh, bigger. Um, way back in 65, we chose the page size of 4096 that was in the hardware. And, and that seems to still be pretty good. Most of the systems I know still do that. Anyway, this is another way to look at the way that virtual address is broken down fairly classical way to do a paging system. Uh, the segment number selects a, a page table, and that can be 256 PTWs, or it can be fewer. Uh, the page number figures out which of those PTWs to use, and that particular PTW points to some place in, in physical memory, a, a classical paging indirect system. And the low order uh, bytes of the address uh, point to the actual, uh, low order bits of the virtual address point to the actual word within the page. And uh, as I said, there is a bit offset in Multics pointers, so you can actually address right to the bit. Um, there, was a, there was an encaching mechanism for each one of these fields. We had an SDW uh, associated memory, and um, that included the access control for the whole segment, the ring brackets, pointer to the page table. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and both of the SDW and PTW associated memory in the, the second generation of hardware were 16 entries long. They were fully associative. They were an LRU managed associative memory. The SDW had a, about a 99.6% uh, hit ratio. The PTW one had about a 98.5.
So they were both pretty effective associative memories. The, the SDW one was probably overkill, uh, but it was the same board for either, so it was easier to manufacture it. And all of the data in the various pages could go into this cache that we had in the system. The cache is a, was a 2K word cache, so it was fairly, fairly small, 2K bytes. Um, words, I don't remember. Yeah, I'm sure it did. Uh, the complements of that virtual address. I didn't mention it before, uh, but there's a ring number as part of the virtual address. And that means that every pointer that gets stored, every pointer that gets loaded, every, every register that contains pointer data has to carry along this ring number. And the hardware has to know how to do that. And basically, the way the hardware works if you're generating an address, is it'll take the maximum of all the rings it could be playing with, the maximum of the ring you fetch that address from, the maximum of the ring that you're currently executing in, and what might already be in the address register at that time. So there's, there's a ring uh, number associated with every address, and, that, and we'll see how the rings work in a sec. Uh, segment descriptor word, as I mentioned, had the ring brackets and the address of the page table. It also had a thing called a call limiter, and a call limiter is used for gates. And gates are the way you get from one ring to another. And I'll, I'll mention it, say how that works in a sec. And the page table where it didn't have anything that you wouldn't be surprised. It had used and modified bits that were set by the hardware. Um, contrary to the way we do it in Voss, the, uh, they're, uh, they're right in the page table word themselves. We have them squirreled away somewhere else, depending on <coughs> what architecture you're looking at. And there were extra bits left over in the page table word, so we put in uh, some software information there just because it was a convenient place to put it. OK, rings. Rings are an interesting, uh, one, one of the interesting features of, of Multics. Other operating systems and hardware support them now. Multics started out with 64 rings originally when we were, um, we were really into layering then. Um, we, when we were simulating the wall crossing faults, and we had special software to go from one ring to another, we, we supported 64 rings. We never used more than two or three. Uh, when we decided to do it in hardware, we cut it down to eight rings. Uh, hardware designers always want to cut down. Um, basically, the way rings work is with every segment, with every one of those 256-page regions of virtual memory, uh, there are three rings, three no ring numbers associated with it. They're called ring brackets, and the way they work is the, the first one, called the write bracket, is you can only modify that segment, you can only write into that segment, uh, if you're in that ring or lower. So if you had a ring brackets of 0, 1, 4 here, you can only write into that segment if you're in ring 0. If the ring brackets were 4, 4, 4, you could write into it from any ring 0 through 4. Now, in order to write into a segment, you also had to have the write permission bit on in the SDW. Just because you were in the right ring, didn't mean you could write in it. You also needed explicit write permission. Um, the execute bracket says that you can execute that segment in any rings from uh, R1 to R2. So in this case, you can execute in, in ring 0 or 1, but you can only execute in ring 0 if you already were in ring 0 when you called it. And the third ring bracket is the call bracket, and this is the one that lets you do multi-ring calls. And what that says is indicated here is that if you're above ring 2, which is the ring you have to execute in, but you're less than or equal to the call bracket. That means you're allowed to call this program, but before you actually get in to execute the first instruction, the hardware will have switched you into the inner ring. So the hardware is going to change rings for you. And this is all done at call time. You know, it's a one microsecond you switch into a new ring. Um, the one restriction there is that if you do go into an inner ring, you have to go into the first few words of that segment that you're transferring into. And that's called a gate segment. And the call limiter field of the segment descriptor says exactly how, you know, where the bound is of valid addresses that you can transfer into. So if I were in the user ring, which was in Multics ring 4, where most of the code was executed, and I wanted to call into the kernel, the kernel program would have ring brackets probably of 004 that gets into the kernel. And since I'm not in the executing ring, it'll cause a wall crossing fault in the old system, or it'll do a real ring transfer in the new hardware. Um, this gives you a lot of capabilities. It means that you can change your level of privilege very quickly um, without having to validate arguments. You can, you can load registers with any kind of uh, 
counterfeit data, counterfeit rings, whatnot, but uh, you can't take advantage of it until you go into, uh, because the hardware will automatically check you. When you go into an inner ring, the hard, hardware will make sure that you haven't counterfeited any data in pointer registers or whatnot. Um, and from a performance standpoint, you don't need to do the wall crossing validation that we do even today in Voss. So that's a big win. When we went to the, um, the new hardware, we figured that going, using rings, one uh, gained us maybe 10% of the system. We figured we were spending 10% of the system doing the wall crossing validation. Uh, so looking at it that way, it's not clear it's worth it because 10% is negligible compared to an uh, optimizing PO1 compiler. <laughs> that was, Richard made me say that. <laughs> so that, that's what rings are. Prime has rings. They have three. They only use two? We have two. They, they, yeah, they had four. I thought they only used three. Did you use? Oh, okay. Right. Three or four is probably all you really need. Okay, here are some of the, I want, I want to get into some of the software now. These are some of the critical features. All of these sound old hat to now, but they were really first tried with Multics. And the, and the amazing thing is they're all tried at the same time. Um, we, we tried to, to do an operating system in a high level language. That's not too bad. We tried to do it in a language that hadn't yet even been defined. And certainly there weren't any compilers for. So for the first year or so, we were always wondering whether it was the hardware, the compiler, or our code. We didn't have that problem at Voss. Occasionally there'd be a compiler bug, but it was totally different. We, on Multics, we were always claiming it was one of the compilers. By the time I left, there were three versions of the PO1 compiler that had been implemented. I think that's all there were. Uh, anyway, some of the key points, virtual files and segmentation. All of the files in Multics, out in our directory hierarchy, um, get mapped directly into segments, hardware segments. Um, that's the way Multics uses that segmentation hardware. There are other operating systems that Honeywell was contemplating to put on the Multics hardware that had nothing to do with Multics. One of the versions of GCOS that they were thinking about was going to use the Multics hardware in, in some uh, strange way. Um, the way Multics uses it, the virtual files, is probably the right way to use the segmentation. It's clearly what it was meant for. Rings, initially a software issue. Uh, it's, as a matter of fact, it's always a software issue because of you have to keep track of, of which ring a, a segment is associated with. When you make a seg somehow map a segment into the physical hardware, you have to find the rings, ring brackets for it out of its directory entry or whatever. Um, initially, it was a total software problem because we had to use them in the validation of arguments and whatnot. Dynamic linking, uh, an important feature of Multics, and it made a lot of things that you can do in Multics possible. I'll get into that in some more detail. Data and program sharing. Um, a lot of other systems were coming up with this at the same time, but this was uh, certainly new about the time of Multics. Directory hierarchy and path names started with Multics. A lot of other people were talking about it. Unix picked it up, obviously. Uh, now it's old hat. Everyone assumes that you've got something like that. Security. Access control lists uh, were first done in Multics. <coughs> later on, 10 or so years later, we added something called the Access Isolation Mechanism, or AIM. Uh, non-discretionary access control. Um, but security was clearly an important feature within Multics. It was going to be a computing service that many people from around the world could get into and leave their data and not worry about it getting m messed up or, or stolen or whatever. As I mentioned, PO1. It was a, an important concept to try to do an operating system in a high-level language. Um, generalized I.O. Uh, concept of an I.O. stream, later replaced by an I.O. switch, something like a file descriptor in Unix, some general port mecha mechanism to do I.O. Prior to that, there were statements in languages like write tape or read BCD <coughs> file or whatever they might be. Uh, all of the code was recursive, pure, there was an, and binding was an option. Uh, the compilers all generated code that could be directly addressable by the hardware. You didn't have to do anything else to it at all. Um, another feature that was uh, not there on day one but came in a couple of years after was the dynamic reconfiguration. You could add and delete CPUs and memories. Very important. Uh, a lot of the larger sites that had Multics uh, do that a lot. And those were all pretty much done in Multics the first time and they, um, they tried to do it all at the same time. Some of the competitive features uh, of the software, again this is somewhat similar list, 
those were some of the languages that were there when I left. Uh, I'm sure there are more now. Uh, Emacs was certainly a language on Multics. It's, it's not quite there on, on Stratus. Security was an important feature. A lot of the sites that have Multics got it just for security. Uh, last year, uh, Multics finally got its B2 uh, rating from the government, which is, uh, which is no, no easy deal. It's very expandable, both in terms of the software you can put on it and how big an application can grow, you know, lots of segments, lots of virtual memory available to you, but also it's expandable in the terms of the way you can throw to together architecture. You can add another processor. Uh, admittedly, you may have to run in a new 600 amp service to your building, but you could add a lot of hardware to it at once. There were many administrative controls that were pretty novel and, and unique at the time. Most of them we have in Voss, uh, not, not surprising. It was very adaptable. Um, there was a mechanism whereby someone generating an application could get his application running as the first program when you got out of ring zero that got executed. In, in Voss, we still can encapsulate a, an operating uh, an application by starting with a startup command macro and, and not letting him hit break or whatever and get out of it and get into that application. But when that's the case, you've always got your command history in the stack, your command macro history in the stack. Certainly not as clean as what Multics did. Everyone claims ease of use. Multics actually had a bunch of ease of use features. It also had some features that were. <laughs> um, there were a lot of mul uh, performance tools associated with Multics, uh, pretty similar to what we have now on Voss. Um, and clearly, we're, we're, we're right in the phase of trying to figure out how we can really make them good on Voss. Um, I don't know how much better they are in Multics now than when I left. Right now, they were, when I left, they were about what we have in Voss today. Um, there was one key feature that we did have on Multics that we don't mm -hmm. have now, and that was a trace facility. Um, the, w the way the Multics call push return worked was that whenever you wanted to call another program, you went into the equivalent of P1 operators uh, in our system. And so every call went into an operator. So we could replace P1 operators very cleanly and trap every call and trace it, read the uh, machine state, collect the CPU time and page faults. And we could uh, create a trace of all of the programs that were called. And it was always very surprising what you'd find out. Uh, we, we traced, for example, an echo program that echoed one character. And, you know, 750,000 calls later, the, e the character is on your screen and you've got a ready message. It's always amazing what you find out on those things. And that's something that we've talked about putting in, on Voss. And uh, I don't know what the status of that is right now. It's certainly not being dropped. And Multics had the first commercially available relational database. It was something called Merge, and it had a query language and uh, uh, a, a language in which you could define uh, queries. That was a thing called Lila. Um, but it was a real uh, relational database. It didn't perform very well, and it still hadn't performed well when I left. I don't know if they really got it better. They were certainly working on it when I left, and so it's probably a lot better. principles. A lot of this is what we do in Voss. There are a couple of key ones that are, that are different. Um, one important thing is that initially, for the first, well, many years, before it was really a commercial product and controlled by Honeywell, it was a research product project. And so there were a lot of people doing things on Multics uh, just to see if they were fun, see if they worked, see, see what kind of things might make sense. And at CISL, we, when we were scheduling people's projects, we had about, you know, it varied, but 25% of the time was unaccounted for. You could pretty much do what you wanted to do, experiment with stuff. Now, that's, some, that's a, a frill. That's a real luxury that an academic community can have. We can't get away with that in, in a commercial uh, stockholder, stock-held company. But it's certainly uh, something that I'd like to see. We have design reviews. We had a lot of them, many more than Voss. We're going to get into more in Voss, I'm sure. We had code auditing. Initially, it was all done by one person. Um, eventually, that got to be too much of a load for him, but uh, that became a, an important part. Who was that one person? Noel Morris. He used to audit every piece of code that went in the, in the kernel. Um, he never audited the compiler, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> we, had a, uh, we had a mechanism called the Multics Change Review Board, and this board itself changed over time quite a bit. Uh, at one time, it was a select group of people selected by upper management, half a dozen people, and that created a lot of trouble because 
everyone wanted to be on the board. Um, Later on, it was open, and there'd be 30 or 40 people trying to decide whether that feature or this name of a control argument was appropriate, and that was unmanageable. I guess it really never got manageable until Bob Mullen took it over and, and really got a hold of it. Uh, that was just after I left. But what it was was a... Good day. <laughs> I was just a, an observing member. I see. Um, but it was a real... Uh, um, strong methodology to get changes into the system. Um, to, by the time I left, uh, approval of the MCR board was required before you even began to do some work. Now that's kind of counter to the 25% hack time. And a lot of people did little projects on their own at night or on weekends or whatnot, and eventually it turned into something that was in the system. But um, the, the, the way the method worked is that you'd, uh, you'd write a, an MCR you document all of the interfaces that you were going to someday implement. You would then bring it before the MCR board. They would approve it or butcher it or tell it to go back. This was actually complicated because there was a board in Phoenix and Sicil, and they had to uh, both approve it. And there were very complicated voting rules as to whether something was approved or not. If it got approved, then it was up to management whether or not to let people do it. Now, this is what happens with a big company after many years of trying to figure out how to do things. Uh, originally, we didn't do that. Originally, we were throwing stuff in pretty much the way we were in Boss for the first few years. It's a very idealistic environment. People, yeah, Richard. Right, the difference there is that every change in the system required an MCR, whether it was a one-line bug fix or anything. Every change. <laughs> yeah, it's like a description of what it's going to be with with the full documentation required, full user level documentation required. And that, that was good, and we're trying to get into that in Voss as well. We use structured techniques, uh, nothing new there. Um, PL1 was as a new concept at the time. The system was indeed easy to evolve. We added new hardware, new features, new protocols as, as, as the years went on. Um, so all of those structured techniques really work. Uh, we use them in Voss. I mean, there's, those aren't, certainly aren't unique to Multics, but it's one of the reasons Multics lasted. And there was an interactive orientation to the whole system. Um, although batch was done pretty much the way it is in Voss, you know, it was the same environment for, for interactive or what in, in Multics is called absentee. Batch was a bad word. Um, it was the same environment, but the emphasis was on interaction. And the scheduler had little hooks to make it better for interactive programs if you wanted to use it or not. Not unlike any time sharing system has to do something there. The next picture is going to really shock you, and this is going to be a surprise. Um, we have a directory hierarchy, and there's a lot of similarity between Voss and what we have uh, had on Multics. Uh, system control, we decided to call it system, but it has a bunch of uh, databases having to do with managing the system, overseer and whatnot. We, have a, we had a process directory on Multics called process dir dir. It's the directory that contained the process directories for each process. Um, a Multics process could not live without a process directory. As a matter of fact, the process, the, the mechanism of creating a process on Multics, the first thing it did was created a process directory, and then it created a file in that process directory called a process initialization table, and then it filled in the initial parameters for that process and put it into that file. And so there was a real directory there before a process ever got going. Um, needless to say, Multics processes were, were, they're actually worse than a fork, I think. They were, they were pretty expensive to get going. Um, there was a directory called daemon dir dir where your print queues went and whatnot. We have a directory called queues. And then there was UDD for user dir dir. Off of that were a bunch of project directories and then user directories, very similar organization to what we have in Boss. And there were many libraries, system library one, two, three, four, auth main library, all kinds of libraries. Um, the one thing that's probably uh, a lot of people don't know about Multics is that most of the source of the system was, was shipped with it. And it was online at many sites if they could afford the disk. So yeah. if you ever, what? All right, all of the source. So that if you wanted to make a change in the system, you had the source. And so the way the CAC would get a bug fix out to the field is they'd say, Go pull this program out, change this line to this line, recompile it, rebind it, do whatever you want to do. If it was a kernel, you had to regenerate the system tape. 
but uh, that could all be done by the customers. A lot of customers did that on their own, made their own little enhancements or whatever to the system. The, the, su the support of the system was, uh, wasn't anything like what Voss is, what, what Stratus is faced with. Even today, I think there's something like 60 multic sites all together. Half of them are in Europe. And um, so, so there's not a great deal of effort that has to go into supporting changes that users make. Um, one other thing here, uh, which, which goes into the process directory, these are a bunch of files that you need before a process can do anything. Uh, temporary files are put there, but they get cleaned up as well, kind of like our temporary files do. But there's a process data segment, which is uh, analogous to ours. We have a, a region that has that. There's a, a KST, which is a known segment table. And as you make files out in the global file system uh, mapped into your particular process, uh, you assign them a segment number, and that's the index into this known segment table. As I mentioned earlier, there's a descriptor segment. And that's just a normal file out there. Turns out it's got ring bracket 000, so you can't do anything with it unless you're in the kernel. Uh, but it's a file, and it has a branch in the directory that's out there in the process directory. Um, there are stacks and combined linkage sections and whatnot that go out that are in the process directory. These are all in the process directory because they're all temporary. They're associated only with that process. One interesting and important fact that you have to consider, though, is that that's a normal directory out there in the system. And a user can give access to these files to any other process it wants to. And that means that the stacks and the combined linkage and the internal static are potentially shareable by any number of processes out there. So that you have to be very careful. We had to be very careful when we were uh, software validating arguments because we had to copy it before validating it, clearly because some other process might be changing it. We can't be sure that we're the only process that's accessing the data. OK, so, so we have a directory uh, hierarchy. And a lot of the files that are needed to actually run a process um, are, are really in the uh, file system. Which brings us to what a directory is like. And uh, this looks pretty similar, uh, familiar rather. Uh, wherever there's a star, we've got something like that in VOS, um, segments, directories, and links. Um, we have something called access class in Multics. And what that is is uh, non-discretionary access control. There are 18 categories, uh, need to know basis. And there are seven levels, secret, top secret, some that we don't, we're not allowed to know the names of. Um, Access control lists are associated with segments. Multics had something different from a default access control list. They had something called an initial ACL. And when you created a file, the file got an access control list put on it by copying it from the directory. So there was the only access control you had to look at was this, the access control list on the actual file or directory. Now, that, of course, wasn't good enough. We had to have a special access control list in the sky called a spackle. Um, but that, that, that was a kind of a side feature for very super users. Um, it was an author. It was a bit count. It told you how big the file was. Uh, and there's a bit count author, which is kind of like our author. It's the last person to modify the file. Um, there was something called a copy switch. And what a copy switch says, if ever anyone wants to map this file into their address space, into their process, copy it. And then uh, leave the original template untouched so that you can so you can have a pre-initialized database or data structure. Um, so a copy switch is used for that. Um, as a current length, max length, those are kind of common. The reason you need a max length is that you've got a segment that's uh, some region of virtual memory. And you can make that smaller than 256 pages if you want to, down to, as I said, 16 word boundaries. Um, if you go outside of the bounds of what that should be, you'll take uh, out of bounds fault. And that's a, a new fault that, that's a fault that Multics has that we don't have. Has the date, time, stamps, created, used, whatnot. Um, one thing that Multics doesn't have is a file system in the sense that we have file I.O. in VOS. It doesn't have in the operating system the ability to do record I.O. The only thing you can do is map 250 uh, megabyte worth of data into a segment and reference it. Now, clearly, the various languages and whatnot and the database products need some kind of file system in B-trees and whatnot. And we have, we have that capability in Multics. It's, it's still there. But it's all done 
pretty much outside of the kernel. It's, there is a flag in a directory that says this is part of what that MSF means, a multi-segment file. That means that well, I want to treat all of these segments, 256 page units, as one big file. Um, OK, primary name is, is what we have in VOS. Multics had the abis- ability to have arbitrary number of names on a file. And that means there was an add name and delete name capability. Um, that, that's, that would have avoided our need for something like add entry names. Basically, in Multics, you would have added the names instead of linking to them directly. Um, the additional names on files were necessary for the linking. And I'll, and I'll get to that in a sec, as to why you really need the ability to do that. It's, it's basically the same as why Voss needs the add entry names. Uh, Multics had directory quotas, saying how many blocks of disks this particular directory sub-hierarchy could use. Uh, we've wanted that in Voss. That was on one of our initial uh, list of things to do. We've never done it. Safety switches like ring, ring brackets, of course. New safety switch is similar to our safety switch. Um, security out of service is a bit that says that's set by the salvager or the, the kernel when it notices something is wrong. Basically, what it says is something happened. Either the system crashed and this file was open or, or something, and I can't tell what kind of access you should, anyone should have to this. And before you're allowed to reference it, someone has to, some security officer has to go in and reset that bit. Um, unique ID. There were meters for each file right out in the file system uh, on, on how many page faults and whatnot it took. And there was a file map, which could be up to 256 disk addresses. A little bit about security. Um, to get into Multics, you needed a password. Uh, the Air Force was our most, uh, well, they asked for most of us, most from security in general. And they proposed or required that we provide a whole bunch of features. Uh, one time, they wanted us to punch a bunch of cards and hand them out to people. And you had to use the passwords in that order. There were programs to generate pronounceable passwords that were nonsense words. Um, Passwords timed out. You had to a bunch of the stuff that we're slowly adding into to, to Voss. We had access control lists. There were rings of protections in the gates that I mentioned earlier. A special way to go from one privilege level to another. The access isolation method uh, mechanism was uh, a critical thing. It's so that multiple leveled users could use the same operating system. Um, that's what that's the, that's key before you can get what's called a B level rating within the government's uh, rating bureau. Um, one of the interesting things is a write-down path. Uh, what that means in the world of security is that um, somehow you're at, say, top secret level, and you can somehow put, you somehow have access to write into, say, a secret database. That's a write-down path. That means someone may leave a Trojan horse in there to copy data that's accessible to a top secret user into a database that's readable by a secret user. Well, those write-down paths are very hard to remove from the system. And pretty much you can prove that if there's any sharing in the system, you can't do it at all. And Bob Mullen wrote a program that was very, very elegant. It looked at the paging rate of the system from one process. And there was another process over here causing perturbations in the paging rate. And the way he did that was he, he'd page a lot for a second and then not page. And he could actually, the other process could actually read data from the paging um, behavior of the system, and it would print out uh, the text that this one process was trying to um, transfer to the other process. And it was a very high bandwidth channel. So as soon as you can share something, in this case, it was the paging resource within the system. As soon as you can share something, the write-down paths are very difficult to avoid. Um, AIM is an excellent example of how extensible uh, Multics was. Uh, It was added to the system after it was completely implemented as, a, as an additional feature by uh, about three or four people, three of them that work for Stratus now. Um, but, it, but the system was extensible enough to accept that fairly, fairly elegantly. Greg. Some of the other things that are required by any security system are audit trails, say when violations occurred. And I just learned today that you need to put in audit trails for even when violations don't occur. Um, 
User device attachment controls, one of the things that was, that was added to the Multics hardware with, the, with their second generation I.O. controller called the I.O.M., was the ability for the IOM to use a page table in main memory to, to, to specify the region of virtual uh, physical addresses in memory that you could touch. And the hardware actually did base and bounds checks against that page table. It was like a segment that was a window. So the IO, you could write actual user IO drivers, run them in ring four, the user ring, and have them do real hard IO connects and whatnot. The kernel would have to make the connect instruction, but uh, it, was, it really allowed uh, user I.O. drivers to be written. Message segments are an interesting security feature that, that existed in ring one. Most stuff in the system was in ring four or ring zero. Uh, message segments were in ring one because they didn't have to be quite as uh, privileged as the kernel. They had something called extended access, which is kind of like on our Q files. Uh, add Roswa, add, delete, read, own, status, wake up. The wake up access was, was uh, supposedly added to avoid Bob Frankston from sending people mail. Um, I don't know if everyone knows Frankston. He's the one that invented VisiCalc. And he was a, he's a multician from way back. And he used to send people mail on everything. And he used to fill up mailboxes. And so people didn't mind the mail as much as the wake-ups. You know, you have mail, you have mail every time. That was also the reason for the maximum length on segments. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> one, uh, one other anecdote about security. Uh, while the Air Force was evaluating the system to see if it was really secure or, or met, met the claims that, that we, we made, uh, there was a one-year period where there was kind of a contest, a uh, friendly rivalry. The Air Force was going to spend a year looking for security holes, and we were going to spend a year looking for security holes. And if ever, at the end of the year, we'd tell what we'd found. And it was actually pretty impressive. We found uh, two or three. They found three or four. But it was pretty secure. And, and particularly after the year, there were very few holes in it. But, but one interesting thing has happened. And one day, on the operator's console, up on the third floor of the IPC center, a paragraph started to print out in the operator's console. And it was a paragraph from some uh, Honeywell literature on how secure Multics was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was done by these Air Force people that were trying to beat the system. And they found a wide open hole in the system that you could just do anything you wanted in there. As a matter of fact, one of the things they did in that year was they laid some traps later on. They patched source because the libraries were there. Although they were protected by access control, they actually changed the source so that the next time we compiled that program, it would put in a different security flaw. And we found that, but not until someone had used it to beat the system again. So they were, uh, that was an interesting year to see who, how that would work. A couple of things about system administration. I know I'm running late. Um, I'm not even going to get into the good stuff, I'm afraid. All right. I'm, um, <laughs> the system administration was hierarchically organized um, Somewhat like Voss, but it really required uh, a project administrator as well as a system administrator. The user could do some of his own stuff, like change his password or, or his default group or project. Um, certainly had control over his own objects. Project administration was done by um, project administrators who were assigned by the system administrator. You could specify up to four for the project. And they could set limits, either daily or monthly or per shift limits, on how much each one of the people in their project could use, how many resources they could use. Uh, directory quotas was one resource, but, but dollars or CPU time was another important resource. And uh, this was pretty valuable when we were in our penny-pinching days and we didn't have enough CPU time. And MIT only allocated us so much CPU time. And so we had to, to allocate it fairly carefully. Um, system administration is kind of done the kind of classical stuff. There are, there's this concept of pricing the resources in the system. And the, and the Multic system had these accounting controls to continually keep track of how much CPU time, uh, connect time, how many page faults. There was this feature called, there was this other unit of, well, it was a time space product. They were called Frankstons. <laughs> and they were a very strange measure of the system. And they never really measured very much usefully, but we used them for years and years and, and charged people for them. 
Um, ease of use, these are a lot of motherhood type things. Uh, I think the consistency of the call push return in data types, which, which we take for granted in, in this day and age, it was, it was something new back then. Uh, we had. That's an important feature, I guess, of all this. Uh, as I mentioned, the interactive orientation, the shapeable environments. There was a thing called a breathe. It wasn't as good as ours in certain senses. It needed this, a special other command called do to do the substitution for you. Uh, it had exec comms, which are like our command macros, but they weren't automatically found. You had to say EC and then give the name of something. And it wasn't as, uh, anywhere near as elegant as ours. Had basically the same set of program development tools we have. Actually, there are, there are some others on on Multics that we don't have yet. They, they, they have a better story to tell in, in terms of online documentation. There were several forms of getting help. Um, sources online, which is always useful. Uh, there was a thing called peruse text. The help files actually contained information and they were structured in such a way that you could find the calling sequence or the particular names of control arguments and whatnot. So th that was pretty useful. We're, we're going towards that in Boss, but we're not there yet. Uh, there was memo and mail. Memo was something that we still don't have. It's a little count, little alarm type system that, that you can set a memo to go off at a particular time in the future or, or all the time. Um, one of the last things that was going on when I left was they were starting to get into some video support forms and, and uh, menu driven stuff. Uh, certainly wasn't any products, but apparently there's some real products in that area now. Um, there was a consistency in the commands, but nowhere near what we have in Voss. Uh, they would use verbs and nouns in the wrong places. One of the things that the MCR board did a lot was to argue as to whether that was a noun or a verb and should be the first component of a command name or whatnot. Uh, one thing that, that, that Multics did have that we avoided because of all of the grief it caused was short names of commands and control arguments. Uh, add name command would probably have the short name AN. It's easier to type. We decided in Voss to punt the whole issue, not worry about it, come up with real good long names, and let people define their own abbreviations. I think that was the right decision. And there were a lot of reasonable defaults, which is, which is true in Voss. S some more ease of use um, bullets. No system generation. Um, that's not really true. You had to make the equivalent of a bind kernel. And the way you did that is you, you wrote a whole bunch of files out onto a tape in just the right order so that when you read the tape on, the system could kind of bootstrap itself up. But in that bootstrap process, which still took quite a while, it had to snap a lot of links and, and survey the hardware and do a bunch of stuff. So I think Boss has got a much better story to tell there. No library generation required. Um, online software updates. As, as is mentioned, the source is shipped. And so if you want to fix a bug, you can either tell them to change that source or just send them that source and let them do the compile. And as I mentioned earlier, all you have to do is compile. You don't have to bind it, although most of the, the software that was released happened to be in bound segments. I'll, I'll get what a bound segment is later. Eventually, we got unintended operation to work. We, we, we really discouraged patching the operating system, pretty much, I guess, like we do with Voss. I mean, it's, it's a last resource. If you're careful, it might work. But usually what we told people to do is change the source, make a new tape, and reboot your system. Uh, online administration was an important feature. You could do a lot of stuff on the system in terms of registering users and whatnot uh, without having to bring the system down. Scheduler could be tuned as you were going. The scheduler got pretty fancy towards the end. It had uh, things called work classes where you could partition all of the users into the system into certain work classes and say this work class gets 12% of the machine, this one gets 50% of the machine. And it was statistically done and it, over a long period of time it, it, it got a pretty good, uh, had a pretty good success at getting the right proportions to the various work classes. Automatic file backup, of course. Automatic, except that you do need some amount of tapes. Um, when you get into some of the details of the system, here are some of the key features. I've mentioned them before. Um, I'm not going to get into how we implemented the generalized I.O. or the security. Uh, I want to touch on some of the first four points, though. Um, probably the most important subroutine call concept within Multics is initiate. This is the call you, you make upon the kernel to bring a file somewhere in the global file system to map it into your virtual address space. You know, it's, it's similar to 
what we have in ROS now, except this was the only way you could do reference anything in Multics. Everything had to be mapped into a segment in your, in your virtual, in your process's address space. Um, mapping a file into a segment is called making it known, and the program HCS underscore dollar initiate is the one that did that. HCS underscore is one of the gates into the operating system. It's a has a ring brackets 004, which means you can call, call it from any ring up to four, but it'll always execute in ring zero. And uh, uh, there were probably 10 gates into the operating, into the kernel. Uh, what, what happens in initiate time is that the operating system will find a segment somewhere in the virtual address space. It'll find one that's not being used. Uh, there is a mechanism where you can specify which one you want it to use, but that's, that's pretty rare. Usually, you just say, get me a segment and map this file into it. So you give it a path name, and it returns a pointer. And what that pointer is, it's a valid PL1 data type. It's a pointer that can be used by a PL1 program to reference the data. And what the pointer has in it is, if you recall, it contains a segment number, a ring number, uh, bit and word offsets will be zero, the ones returned here. Uh, but it's a real live uh, addressable beast. I mean, it's something that you can use to address data with. Um, all files were relocatable, all executable files, um, any file in general. Uh, the segment number didn't matter. So you could initiate a segment, and it didn't matter where the operating system put it. Now, that isn't quite true for a few, few special cases. I'll get, you know, when we get into something called pre-linking, um, you had to explicitly initiate them because a bunch of links that had segment numbers in them were already snapped, but I'll get into that. Um, it associates a segment number with a file. Other processes can have the same segment, the same file out there, known in their address space, but with a different segment number. And that all works out. Each that, that mapping is per process. It's in the KST. And so you can have multiple processes sharing the same data, just like we have shared files. In Multics, it didn't have to be in the same region of virtual memory. Um, once you've initiated the segment, uh, the file, into that region of your virtual memory, you just use the pointer. And the first reference to that pointer will probably cause a fault, It'll pr what we call a segment fault. And the reason for that is that we haven't brought in the file map yet or done the necessary other stuff. All we've said is we've assigned a segment number and remembered enough to handle the segment faults later on. Um, what we do is we take the segment number to find the KSC entry, we activate the file, very analogous to what goes on in VOS, and we fill in the SCW with whatever is the appropriate access. Th that concept of taking the segment fault finding the appropriate access and, and whatnot uh, can happen after the system has been running. As a matter of fact, the, the data structures within the kernel that we squirrel away the, the information about that segment, its file map and other stuff, are called uh, AST entries, active segment table entries. And they're, they're a reusable resource. If the kernel finds a, an AST that hasn't been used in a while and it wants it because someone else has faulted on a segment, it will force the other one out. It will deactivate it, and it will use that AST slot. There was a limited number of AST entries in the kernel. So segment faults could happen all the time. That was something beyond your control, very analogous to page faults. Pages could get pushed out of uh, memory. Similarly, segments can be pushed out. One of the features of Multics is that when you change the access on a segment, we go to the trouble in Multics to, to set the SDW in, into a faulting state again so that the next instruction that references that segment will take another segment fault. And it'll have to recompute the access. So that if you wanted to change the access on a file instantly, you could do that in Multics. Uh, in VOS, we only compute the access when you open the file. Um, terminating is the opposite of, of initiating. It, uh, it says that I don't want to use that segment. Decrements the reference count. There's actually a reference count. A bunch of segments can be initiated. Uh, by, by the system for you, and so you don't want to, so we have to ref count that. Stuff that's in this KST, the known segment table, uh, is a segment number. It's actually in there, but it's used as, also as the index into it. Uh, it has the reference names associated with that particular file, and reference names are key to the way the linker works, and I'll get into that in a second. Uh, has the UID of the file, it has some enough mechanism in there so that you can find the, uh, the branch the directory entry for the file so they can get the file map or the access control as to the at other attributes of the file. So that's the type of information you need in order to handle a segment fault. That's what's kept in the KST. Um, a little bit about the storage system. I don't want to say too much. It's a lot like VOS in terms of directories and files, except that in version 
five of the file system, we had a lot of them, we add a volume table of contents to our disk organization. And what that let us do is um, recover from a certain set of failures uh, in, in better ways. It let us um, back the disks up in better ways. You could either back them up in VTOC order. Well, uh, Vitochi is a volume table of contents entry. And uh, you could just index through the Vitochis and find the file maps for the files. They'd be kept in the VTOC entries. Figuring out free storage maps, all you had to do was go through the Vitochis. You didn't have to go through the, an entire directory scan to find all of the disk addresses that were being used. Um, we decided not to do that in VOS. Um, I think the jury's still out on that one as to whether that was the right decision. Um, so, so the storage system, though, is fairly similar to VOS. It's got directories out there and means of, of getting the information about a file, uh, given the name of the file. Path, classical path names. OK, linking is one of the, the key features that Multics had. Uh, it, it makes it possible, dynamic linking in particular, to do a bunch of things that, for example, we can't do in VOS. Um, every command in, Vo in Multics can be, re can be replaced by the user. There's no such concept of internal commands. Users can write their own active functions. It's very similar to a Unix shell. You can write any program that you want there. Uh, the advantage of Multics over Unix is that you don't have to fork a process to execute any one of these commands. It's all done in the, the same address space, um, <coughs> in the same process. At any rate, binding uh, is a concept of taking many of the <coughs> object files that are generated by the compilers and putting them into a bound segment. In order to do that, um, the, the compilers have to generate sufficient relocation information so we know how to relocate all of the various addresses and self-relative pointers within the, the bound segment. Um, <coughs> source goes to an object. That first arrow is a, is a um, compiler. All of the objects go into an archive file. The archive command does that. Uh, the last transformation there is done by the bind command, which takes archive as input and generates a bound segment as output. A bound segment, like one of the outputs of the compiler, is directly executable. Um, the binder resolves the internal references between the objects that are in it, just like our binder does. And any references that it can't resolve are left for the dynamic linker. Or there's another thing called a prelinker. A prelinker is, uh, is like a super binder that takes many bound segments or standalone segments and generates a multi-segment image that can be preloaded into a process. OK. Yes? Are the addresses in a bound segment uh, segment relative or absolute? Segment relative. Always. Multics ran for maybe uh, 10 microseconds before it got into what's called appending mode. And appending mode means that you're, everything is segmented. So one of the very first things that happens in a bootstrap mechanism is that you set up an SDW to, to do some stuff. Um, so everything is segment relative. Um, now, a bunch of these addresses that are in a bound segment uh, may take multiple segments, but they're always relative to one segment. For example, the, uh, the compiler creates uh, four basically different regions. It creates a text section that's got code. It creates a, a static section that's got static internal static storage. It creates a linkage section, which has got uh, cross-module uh, linkage information associated with naming and dynamically linking. And it's got a symbol section. And you can have links to any one of those four sections. You can have a link that the linker has to snap into the symbol section, or into the text section, or into the um, the linkage section itself, um, so that th those links are relative to one of those four sections, depending on, and they could be in different segments. Um, reference names is a key, key um, concept for the, the linking of the system. Basically, the name that you'd see when you're snapping a link consists of two components, A dollar B, foo dollar bar. And the A part before the dollar sign is a reference name. And that's looked up by the search rules. And it's very similar to what we would do. That's why we do add entry names. If there are multiple entry points in the system, you have to have a name. You have to be able to find that by your searcher. That's why we add links to all of the additional entry points in certain of our object libraries. The reference names are cached in an RNT, the reference name table. And that caching creates 
a bunch of confusing situations as things get cached for you that you didn't know were cached. If you ran the PL1 compiler and it happened to call a program called delete, one of its internal things to delete a node, and that, w that left a name around called delete in the reference name table. If then you tried to use the delete command, uh, you would get the PL1 compiler's version of delete because the first thing you look at is the reference name table when you're looking to resolve a link. So that the fact that reference names are cached is a, it's a, one of the hidden dangers of dynamic linking, which is one of the titles of the PL1 book. The PL1 reference manual. Entry name is a is a name that's resolved within a particular segment. So if you had foo dollar bar, you expect to find a named entry point bar somewhere in the segment whose reference name is foo. Now the name the reference name needn't be a name on a file in the file system. There's a command that says that you can use that says make this file known with this reference name or add this reference name to that file. So it's 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 not clean. I mean it can be as complex as you want it. Um, to, to satisfy a linkage fault, in the dynamic case, first thing you do is you find the fault pair, and there's enough hardware information left over in the, the stack, in the machine conditions, to be able to do that. You then find a reference name by using the search rules in effect. And, and some of the search rules were interesting. Typically, you, they would be the, the reference name table is searched first, then your current directory, then the standard system libraries. But there was another interesting search rule called the referencing dir rule, which meant that um, if, if, if segment was existed in this directory, search that directory first. It's, it's a useful concept. Some of our compilers use that internally. Um, it's something we should probably add to our search mechanism. Um, the problem is finding out what, who is it that's referencing it, so that's not always easy. Uh, once the referenced object is found, we search that particular object for the entry name. And the result of that is an offset, either relative to the text or the linkage or whatever. And uh, we just snap the link by forming that the segment number returned by the reference name search and that uh, the entry name search. And that's just a real live pointer. And that pointer is put instead of the fault pair. And the instruction is restarted. On restart, instead of faulting, it will then execute. It'll actually indirect through the link. Uh, that's something, by the way, that the 68020 can't do, as far as I understand, the way Multics did it. Dynamic linking in Multics relied on them to be able to restart that instruction where it was and continue with the indirection. A um, couple of highlights of this linking is that if the reference name doesn't, uh, if, if in the search you don't find it in the reference name table or you don't even find it known anywhere, the system, the linker, will initiate the segment. It will make it known. It'll, bring, uh, it'll map the segment into your process's space. And most of the segments that get mapped into a Multics process are mapped in by the linker. Data segments are, but most of the code segments are. Um, when a segment is initiated, what has happened, uh, a standard segment initiated by the linker, is a copy of the linkage is copied out of the segment into what we, what's called a combined linkage segment. And there can be many of these. They're per ring segments. Uh, similarly, the static is copied into the combined static segment. And, and there's a, there are two databases that are addressable pretty much by the hardware called the lot, the linkage offset table, and the internal static offset table that I saw it, that actually point to where we put those copies of the linkage in static. And so that if you need to, you can find the linkage in static given only the segment number of the, uh, the segment that, that you want that's associated with them. As I mentioned earlier, reference names that are left around can cause surprising errors. And uh, initiate may copy. What I mean by that is that the copy switch that I mentioned earlier in the branch, um, in, the, in the branch data, uh, if the copy switch is on, when the linker gets around to initiating it, it will make a copy of the actual segment. Usually what that's used for is a data segment, like a pre-initialized free storage area typically has the copy switch on. So it's found in the search rules. The linker copies it in, and there's a pre-initialized uh, area already for you there. Um, OK, almost done here. Want to want to put up a couple of highlights, differences between Voss and, and Multics. Multics has those things, and Voss has those things. And, and this is old information. I've been out of touch with Multics for quite a while. Um, and, but this is some of the highlights. As I mentioned, additional names on files, all commands are replaceable. Internal, there's no such concept of internal commands. 
uh, user active function, command line iteration. A lot of systems have that. Um, Voss doesn't. It's, it's a neat feature. Um, Multi-segment files, virtual files. But I, what that means is the way you do um, an indexed B-tree type file, index sequential file for for um, PL1 or COBOL, it'll use a special IO DIM, uh, IO device driver called a called V-file that interprets data in that way as a B-tree or whatever. Multics has APL Lisp, but has a real powerful Lisp, Mac Lisp. Um, Oh, you, can, you can read the list. The uh, Voss has got some pretty powerful things that, that a lot of systems would like to have, in particular Multics. Parse command is really neat, as you all know. Um, as far as I know, Multics still doesn't have anything like that. Um, I guess Multics now has tasking. It, it certainly didn't when I was there, but I've been told they've added that in some way. Multics does not have global networking, does not have a Unix facility. Does, didn't have forms the way I knew it. It certainly doesn't have transaction protection at the basic file system level. In its, in its MERDS database product, you can do uh, atomic operations, but it, it's, it's not like we have built into the system. It doesn't have the extensive uh, communications protocols we have, and it doesn't have the, the nice automatic CM and PM command searching mechanism. Um, a couple of minor points that came up at the last minute that I wanted to throw in. Um, Multics doesn't have the concept of heap for wired heap or page heap or whatever. All of the data within Multics goes into segments, and segments are one megabyte each. And that's, that's a nice hard limitation, so you have to design whatever it is you're trying to do to fit into that constraint. Um, as I mentioned earlier, those ASTs, those things that hold the file maps for active files, uh, for very large systems, one megabyte isn't enough memory to hold all of those. So they've split that up into separate segments in the, in the kernel. Uh, basically, everything is in separately allocated, um, separate segments within the kernel, the different databases. That, that's actually good. It's, it's usually not common that you will use the same uh, segment number with, you know, for s sometimes you can leave a pointer around that's, that's got a segment number and offset in it and pick it up by accident, but that's fairly rare. Wild stores into other segments doesn't happen a lot in Multics. Anything can happen, of course. I happen to like PL1 internal procedures a lot. They really encourage structured programming and, and modularization. They can be very fast in Multics. Uh, the compiler can generate the argument list so that all that has to happen at, at runtime is just a, basically two instructions. And Rich is Uh, we had several projects to speed it up, and there was a lot more fat that could have been gotten out of it. Um, but I think the compiler itself used internal procedures at one point and got 25% faster. There were significant gains because of the internal procedure mechanism. Special hardware is enabled to make arguments compilable, which we don't have on our system. Yeah. And uh, the third key point is that there is no file I/O basically done anywhere within within the system. Clearly, the runtime I.O. of languages has file I.O., uh, COBOL or PL1 language I.O., but pretty much the entire rest of the system doesn't do file I.O. The display mm -hmm. command, which in Multics is called print, doesn't read records displaying them, writing them out to the screen. It just initiates the file that you want to print, and it's got a pointer into it, and it just starts looking for new line characters embedded in it, uh, somewhat analogous to the way um, uh, Unix works. There, there are the basic file system that's out there is not a record-oriented file system. It's just a bunch of bytes, and it's up to all of the applications to figure out how to interpret those bytes. The only way data is referenced is by pointers that way. A um, couple of points. I think I already mentioned system generation. S Generate MST is a program that generates a boot tape and it basically searches a bunch of libraries for where you want to do it, and it puts a bunch of files on the tape with the right tape marks and the right special bootstrap record at the beginning and whatnot. Um, one, one 
thing that has to happen when you do a boot, boot the multic system this way is that you have to snap all the links at boot time. And when I left, that was still a considerable amount of time was spent snapping links, even when we converted it to the fancy EIS instructions. Um, Pre-linking, I mentioned briefly, uh, you can specify that you want to snap a lot of links in some uh, pre-initialized process image. It's really what it is. A lot of the files will already be initia initia initiated, and the what, what the linker does, of course, is it allocates segment numbers and figures out where to put these in relation to the other segments. So pre-linking has to initiate those segments, um, the very same segments in the same segment number slots when it runs. A pre-linked process is a process that gets organized uh, during the process creation time. The first thing it does is says, oh, I'm a pre-linked image, and it just does a bunch of stuff very quickly. Uh, one time we were trying to improve the performance in the system, and about 10% of the system was spent linking. And in Multics, when you'd run a program, the very first time you'd run it, it would snap all its links. The second time, it'd be a lot faster. So a bunch of questions that were asked on performance did, was, did you snap the links first? Is it the first time you ran it in a process or whatnot? Well, in that study to figure out how much time was being spent in the, in the linker, which said 10%, it was clear that there were some obvious speed ups. We, uh, we made, actually made the overhead for linking 5%, which made the, the rationale for doing the pre-linker somewhat less. But the pre-linker is, is a mechanism that's in there today. It's basically a, a, a very large process image that gets created before the process does. OK, those are the only slides I have. Uh, any questions? I ran over. Well, physically, how big is the machine? How fast is it? It's a very big machine. Uh, the first processor was about, consider a box this big. It was about 10 of them. It was all discrete transistors and everything. That was just the processor. Right, that was the processor. <laughs> uh, the, the, the first drum we had was about this wide, this tall, and went to the wall. And that had 4,000 pages on it. So 4,000 blocks. And so it was, uh, what? Four megabytes. Four megabytes. No, it was 4,000 pages, I think. Yeah, 16 megabytes. It was, it was a, that was a drum. And, and the, the drum platters were about this big. It was a big drum. I think it had six platters. Um, the, uh, the very first system had a clock. Multics has a great clock, by the way. 72-bit microsecond resolution, one instruction, you read the clock. I've been working on Bob for five years to get this clock. Um, however, the first version was a box this big to do that. Uh, and that, that used up one of the ports on the system control units. You know, you'd address it as, a one, as that port on the system control unit. Uh, they've got the box down smaller now, so the clocks are, are a lot smaller. But um, that was pretty big. Paul? The thing I remember about the 645 was that they, it, it took a box about as big as a phone booth to hold 16K of core memory. And Four of those would be put around a central doghouse for all the cables. So you had essentially five phone booth sized boxes, a good six feet high, and all that gave you was 64K words, or four times that in characters, memory, and that thing took up, I mean, each, each box was yeah, at least as big as a phone booth. Um, and Multics at that point had um, about 384k, I guess, uh, words. So what's that? Five of those stars, something like that. Or I think we had a denser packing, but it was really massive. But at any rate, it took up the whole ninth floor, or half the ninth floor, at, at uh, 545 Tech Square uh, for the first Multics. They had big motor generators. They had these lousy drum printers. Um, that big paging drum, even though it had 16 megabytes of data on it, stuff was written on it either twice or four times because we couldn't wait for it to go all the way around. So we'd write it halfway around at each track. So you only had to wait for half a revolution to get something off of it. Um, I remember when we did the fast dump routine. Multics in their old days used to dump to the printer. And then we dumped tape, and then we dumped a disk. And the, the day the dump to disk software went in on an MIT, we set a new record 
for the number of crashes in a day. Because what the dump to disk software really meant was that we could, we could crash a lot faster. We could crash 13 times that day. <laughs> Very big, and even the latest hardware is still big. I remember the, the, the first second generation processor had two banks worth of boards in it, at about a hundred boards. Um, they were, these were wire wrap boards. They were about this big, packed with with chips. And there were a hundred of them, half of them to do the EIS. The last one I saw was just like that, except they were all PC boards. So it was about half the size. But it was that big. Oh, now, on these things, 100 boards plugged into probably 200 pin slots, 200 connector slots. And there was a back panel that had I don't know, five or six thousand wires on it, multicolored, very pretty. But if if one of those bottom wires was the culprit or something, I mean, it was just horrendous. Can you mention the EIS a little more and how they made it interruptible and whether they had the good sense to microcode it? <laughs> okay. The EIS instruction is called extended instruction step. Basically, they were. It was three kinds of instructions. It was decimal instructions. Floating point decimal too, uh, 64 uh, digit operands was the maximum size. Probably by the time you fix the divide bugs, it was only 61 digits 59. you could 59 digits you could play with. Um, Honeywell classically blew it when they designed things. When they first designed uh, the EIS, they didn't allow for a segment that had the full two to the whatever bytes. The last one would, they couldn't represent it. Right, they didn't, want, they didn't think you'd ever need a zero length character string. I mean, why, why provide for that? Anyway, um, the, the other things that they provided were for character string. Searching, there was a scan double instruction that would search for two characters in a row and it would just walk down through stuff, through pages looking for those characters. Uh, there were translate instructions. Uh, the, one, the most heavily used one was uh, move, just a move left to right and it was a move right to left and they did the weird things on overlaying and if you were clever you could um, fill with one character and move things. Um, the the problem, okay, okay that, those were two things, basically the character string and, and these decimal instructions. But there were also, um, well, there were there were bit string instructions that let you search for a bit and whatnot. Um, yeah. The, w the way you dis defined the operands is you would have descriptors that said, I mean, typically there were three operand, add A to B and store it in C. And each descriptor said it could be in any one of four or five formats, and here's where it actually is in memory and whatnot. And in the worst case, you could take 11 page faults referencing one EIS instruction as it looks for all of its descriptors and indirect descriptors and the actual data it's going to operate on. And the way those instructions were implemented is that they kept trying. And if, they, and if you couldn't get through, if you couldn't get all 11 page, if they took a page fault doing those decimal instructions, they'd go all the way back to the beginning. And it relied on features within the operating system to clear associative memories when that processor ran again and various things like that. But for the decimal instructions, they go back to the beginning. If you didn't have 11 pages of memory to play with, you would never get out of that instruction. I mean, you'd, you'd just go there forever. Uh, actually, I think it was 13 pages. The, um, the it was a time when we were told our floating point um, sign routine was no good. So in about 10 minutes, I wrote a power series thing using 40-digit decimal instructions to do this. You know, you'd never do it in, in practicality, but I mean, here was the right answer out to 40 decimal digits and and the customer was wrong. You know, we had the right algorithm, but it would do that, yeah. Um, but the real problem was within page faults in mid-instruction, where you had to restart where you were. And what the hardware had was two sets of registers, eight, two sets of data, really, eight words, eight times 36 bits worth of data, called pointers and lengths. 
And this, re this remembered exactly where you were in all your internal registers stepping and how far you'd gotten in your transfer and everything. And whenever we took a fault, we had to make sure, we had to see if we were in a mid-EIS instruction. If so, we had to go to the trouble to save those pointers in length and restore them and whatnot. Um, we, the problem was so bad that we had to write a special program called the EIS tester that, that let us write source programs to, to say, try this scenario, put the data operand here, make the instruction cross the page boundary, and do all these types of things. And uh, eventually, most of them worked. Um, it, it was amazing that they could ever get it to work. No microcode. No microcode. All discrete T squared L. Very, very fast. A typical floating point add was order of microsecond, mic and a half. So it wasn't slow. And this was, you know, 10 years ago. Well, when, I, when I talk about fast, I'm saying one instruction to search in one megawork, one megabyte segment and find something. You may have several hundred page faults in that one instruction. And I think we timed it out and figured that using those instructions for cable searching on LALR, expecting stuff by 70%. Oh, but, yeah. You know, it was limited by the memory bandwidth, period. They, they, were, they were amazingly complex in the fact that they ever got them to go. Of course, the first time we built page faults, the next time we read I'd say two years, maybe. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, uh, depending on what you were doing, it ran a lot faster than that. It took me about a year to debug it. The question, of course, is if you had all that hardware, is couldn't you just make the same old hardware and run it twice to four times as fast? It, it's also probably worth saying that this particular architecture of segmentation and paging and whatnot is, is hard to get really fast. I mean, there, there are definite stages that you have to go through. They were pretty clever to get it as fast as they got it. it was not like this. this was the era of core. processor faster made it work harder and it was worth it. 